as I said earlier, our annual meeting will be after a worship service. And some people made the suggestion that since not everyone will come to the meeting, that my sermon should be a reflection about the ministry done here at Canada United Church. I should deliver some sort of a state of the union discourse, but for a congregation. And who knows, maybe it might inspire some people to volunteer or something later. I thought about that, and I came to the conclusion of why should I do that? I belong to the Generation X cohort, meaning that cynicism is one of important trademark of our group. This is probably why I doubt that even the best sermon I could write would change anything. Even if I come with brilliant ideas and, and projects for the future, there will still be complainers who will keep criticize why I favor Project A over Project B or we are totally wrong to take this or that initiative, could deliver a very passionate 20-minute reflection, the fact will remain. That's always the same volunteers sitting on our committees and participating to our activities. There's never enough money, never enough people sitting in the pews, Never enough vision about the future. Oh, we might work hard, but when we look at the state of our congregation, our neighborhood, our world, there's days we wonder, what's the point? There's days when we doubt if, if even God noticed what we're trying to do down here. Maybe, maybe my reflection is affected by this time of the year. The excitement of Christmas is over now. It's cold outside. It's, it's still snowing, meaning that we will have to shovel again. The light is increasing, but surely not fast enough. My feet are always freezing because my boots are worn out and there's no good one in the stores right now. It's all about spring, so too bad if your need is not in sync with our marketing strategies. Look around myself and keep wondering, what's, what's the point of all of this? What difference will it make if I fill my recycled bin while some Canadian industry released billions of ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. But different will it make if I volunteer at the mission downtown, if government cuts programs for the most vulnerable in our society? What difference will it make to put five more dollars in the collection plate every week if some people who are making five times my salaries saying they have to choose between the cause they support because they need to be careful. Who would notice my effort? What's the point? Some days we're just, we're just brain. We're losing hope. Source of joys are difficult to identify. We find it harder and harder to remember the, the goals and the ministries and the call God has placed in our hearts. We feel besieged from all sides and, and unable to get everything together. Life makes us weary. It depletes us from the strength we need to just get out of the bed and do the things we're required to do every day. And then, and then we come across this passage from the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 21 to 31. Probably never heard a sermon written about it, maybe 
maybe that's why I selected this morning, even if I fell this week, and I said often that I paint myself in the corner. It's a beautiful poetic text filled with powerful images and metaphors. Uh, I get this, I get this. But this said, it's not easy to extract a good sermon out of it, especially in the context of a liberal and progressive congregation. I do not believe that God is some sort of master puppeteers controlling every aspect of our lives, overseeing the rise and the fall of great civilization, or decide who will be the winner of the Super Bowl. And yet, and yet there's something in this text about a God that is bigger than us. Sometimes we want to create a God at our own image and not the, way, the other way around. We want to put God in a little convenient box he could open and close at our will. We want to analyze and define God according to our own human criterions. However, the God presented here by the prophet is a different kind of God. It is a God so great, so, so majestic, that we look like tiny grasshopper in comparison to God. It is a God who is part of the creating process since the beginning of time. It is a God who cannot, who we cannot begin to fully imagine and understand with our limited human brain. In this text, there's something about a God who cares about us, even if it seems unbelievable. This omnipotent and omniscient God is concerned by the little, small, and imperfect me. Somehow I seem to matter. In spite of my helplessness, brokenness, cynicism, and, and multiple flaws, I am accepted as I am. God knows me and calls me by my name. I'm loved to the point that God actually cares about what's happening to me. God's might and power goes end in end with empathy and understanding of my human frailties. I am told that I can always rely on God, especially in my darkest hours. In this text, there's something about the God who gave us strength when we needed the most. On many or oh, so many occasions during our existence, we feel that we just hit rock bottom. We're in the gutter, we just touched the end of the barrel. We're disparate, we're discouraged. And all the marker we use to define ourselves, like our job, our family, our identity, our religious affiliation are not enough to fill this, this void and emptiness we might have inside of us. And in those challenging moments, God offer us meaningful and personal relationship. God keep offering us words of encouragement. We are, when we are exhausted, weary, about to stumble, we, re, we can remember the promise that God will renew our strength. God will help us to mount up mountains like, like eagles. Because of God, we will be able to run the race set before us without wearing out. We believe that God will give us the energy we need when we're ready to give up. There's something in this text about God who is constantly empowering us. Because it would be so easy for God to intervene in human affairs and saying, this is exactly what I meant in the Bible. This is the right doctrine to follow. This is how you should vote. This is right, this is wrong. But no, that's not the way that God works. 
in time of ex exhaustion, oppression, or other moment of greatest need, God who fully knows us, fully knows us, trusts us to make the best call we can do and to act in the best way we can. Like Brianna reminded us just a few weeks ago, we are told by God to take all of our flaws, our weakness, our liability, and to turn them into something positive and to do something with it. When it comes to faith and religion, we're told not to adopt a consumer attitude. Oh, I put some money in the plate, so I'm expecting something back in return, like, like services, like privilege, like gratitude. I pay that minister, so I don't have to come with the solution. No, no, no. We're not called to adopt a, an attitude of a follower. I'm not a leader here. I cannot make decisions. I cannot take an initiative. Someone else will do it at my place. No, no, no. We're called to be something closer to ministers. When Martin Luther came up with this famous priesthood of all believer, he did not mean that all of us are the same and all of us have to do everything. Each and every one of us has a part of, to play in, in, in all of this. We're in being part of something bigger than ourselves. We belong to this group that is, yes, imperfect, full of flaws, and sometimes argue for small details, but nevertheless, try to care for one another and care for the rest of the world. We come to this safe place when we can try to stretch our gifts and our abilities. We are involved in a community where the result is not based on efficiency, but according to faithfulness. And this is why, this is why, and some of the reason why we sort books in this measurable portable when it's so cold outside, when we accept to vacuum those rugs and clean those toilets in a building that is not even ours, why we come to open and close these doors when we have a rental, why on Sunday morning some are skipping worship to spend time with children that are not even their own, why why we're giving an evening about once a month to serve on the committee, why we accept to increase our weekly donation. When we look, when we look back at the last few months we spent together as a community of faith, a community of faith called Canada United Church, it would be so easy to pick all the elements that went wrong to focus on the negative or to highlight everything that is missing in our midst. By, but by doing so, we would forget one of the most essential aspects of our congregation, God. God who is constantly dwelling in our midst. God who keeps calling us by our name. God was empowering us. God raised us up when we could not go further. And despite all our flaws and our cynicism and our criticism, God trusts us to run God's church, to do ministries in our ways, to change the life of those we meet, and to have an impact in our world. And this is the point of all of this. This is the point of all we're trying to do here, day after day, here at Canada United Church. Amen.